problem is, is therefore, to, to um, I mean, leaving aside the economic and financial aspects, which would make it difficult anyway, but even if one had uh, um, the, the economic possibility to make the kind of statement you want, you, you're talking about, you still have a problem with the interface, finally, because the, the area which one is given so often in these areas, this, 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 this situation, doesn't make a, an appropriate uh, um, context for interface. You know. But uh, I feel in a way that, that this last building is really more or less an illustration of what uh, what Ken was talking about in his speech in, in the yeah, uh, no. I think, I and, think. But in a way, you know, the, uh, I don't think that is really to find uh, almost the alienation of, of this structure, which is so different from the environment, to create a place. But is it really becoming, by being so different, a place, or is it just uh, like being something totally strange to the place? And, and by that, it's rather negative than, than making really an identifiable uh, point in the landscape. Well, do you it's, have a it's certainly identifiable? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, that. is that enough to create a place? But do you have a mental is picture of, a, of, of an alternative solution? I mean, I mean, you must, if you think that the solution we've done is, is wrong for this and this reason, now what would be a, an alternative strategy, as it were, for that kind of building? I mean, Ken has suggested uh, there might be some axial roof and some, some, some sort of entrance system, but can you think of anything? I think uh, it is written. a very precise typology, because and that's what I agree with it, with the critique in the in the architecture uh, de Rodri, that there is sort of a very vagueness of, of the type. You know, it can be really anything. And always because it doesn't really signify uh, anything precisely. It's just a universal rule. And uh, and by that it becomes really I think in this confusing townscape it becomes a further confusion that you don't really know is the school a supermarket or a shadow. But it hasn't got a function. I mean, that's sort of, it, it, it isn't a building with a function, actually. It's, it's, it's one of these buildings that are, that are thought out by well-meaning libertarian idealists in social services. In fact, it's underused, you know. And it's, 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 the actual function of the building is extremely vague. And, and it, it, I think that the building has to be a kind of floating signifier. But you know, I mean, one can imagine it being converted into another use. I'm feeling a slightly side-stepping side problem because it, it is a public building. I mean, I, I think that, I think, you know, it gets into a slightly argument because, you know, because society hasn't made up its mind what it is, then one has a universal structure. But, um, and uh, we can say that's a very unfortunate uh, sort of dilemma of grief that one fell into. But I think that, that, that I think up, up until very recently, uh, and, and in fact of recent day, professionalism has, uh, and it's not the first time, you know, uh, come preoccupied with, with technology or the display of technology when the, 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 the in a higher priority given to the um, the status of the object in the society and the expression of that status. Now, I mean, I realize that it comes to such a good argument, but uh, I think that I, I don't feel that your, your defense of it, uh, the one you just made, really, really answers the, the criticism. Well, I think in a way, the solution lies in your own work you know, in, the, in the school. In the first school, the way, a very strong hierarchy of, of public realm, which then uh, has some more private rooms grouped around, but that creates yes. a very strong place. Yes. But I think it's much easier to do that in a very big building, like the school, where, where there's a tremendous yeah. build, the building has a tremendous scale in itself, and that can, therefore it could be it could be broken down into elements without losing its um, its image, five image. But I think in Melrose Avenue is a tiny building, you know, and we were trying to give it. Maybe we weren't successful, but we were genuinely trying to give it some scale. Also, the environment that you put it in <coughs> itself bears no recognition of such distinctions as public or private in the very layout of a suburban uh, set of buildings. There is no uh, consciousness of that kind of distinction. 
and it's very difficult to see how anything that can be put into it can play any role of that sort that tries to find that kind of identity, because it only finds that identity in an overall environment or an overall argument. Yes. On the one hand, and on the other hand, no matter what you do, you're always faced with the problem of classifying. Because does one take the arg argument ad absurdum and say that each and every building, or each and every situation, consciousness of that kind of extinction, and it's very difficult to see how anything we can put into it can play any role of that sort that tries to find that kind of identity, because it only finds that identity in an overall environment or an overall argument. Yes. On the one hand, and on the other hand, no matter what you do, you're always faced with the problem of classifying, because does one take the arg argument ad absurdum and say that each and every building, or each and every situation that you've got, perhaps even within a building, is rendered down to its most particular sort of unconscious uh, expression of what you think its identity should be. You obviously can't do that, nor should you do that. So at some other extreme, you're forced, uh, <coughs> rightly, to make distinctions between various kinds of significance. Um, and I think it's one of the problems that anybody who's designing a building in any kind of environment has got to do. On the one hand, you have an, perhaps an ideal set of hierarchies, which... Uh, <coughs> you know, you could subscribe to if the world were different. But on the other hand, you've got also the actual world that presents Alan and John or any of us with an environment which has no recognition of these things. Um, so I think you're always faced with that dilemma, including the, such things as the gesture of the entrance, because the gesture of the entrance that you're doing uh, at another level, which also may be equally absurd, can become a, a, a very rhetorical thing, competing in a welter of otherwise meaningless gestures all around it. But I think that it's a very complex dilemma. I think also the, the, the question of what meaning forms have is a very delicate one, because while you were talking, it struck me that um, perhaps at the back of our minds, there was this feeling that uh, a community centre is mostly for children, and for young people, and it should, be, it should suggest light <coughs> and air and sunlight and uh, freedom and so on, which you could say that these elements that we use do, do um, suggest. On the other hand, of course, you can read it another way, which is obviously the way you're reading it, which is that what we're doing is producing a slice of universal technology, which is anti-human and anti-children and everything, you see. But I th think that the meanings that one attributes to these things are very, very ephemeral. They change. They not only change from one person to another, they change in a very rapid, in a very short period of time. When you think of the, of the meanings that were attached to the modern movement in the 30s, which were all to do with the curing of consumption and so on, and, and, uh, and the meanings attached to them are, are totally different. So how is it that you can say that... How is it you can say... the public at large. I think by architects, because they have accepted a certain set of rules and designing... Yes, but the public also accepts a certain set of rules. You're not surely suggesting the public is uh, na natural and the architects are unnatural. Everybody obeys certain rules. Everybody obeys the rules of their subculture. as much as the architect. But you know, I, I think exactly. this, uh, we, we nevertheless do encourage a very strong empirical position, which has, for a long time, uh, chosen not to uh, deal with this question of the of uh, public and private. And uh, I mean, that that is built into the problem. elevation of empirical fact or elevation of means uh, into the whole expression, you know, as opposed to the status of, of objects in society. And we, we, we inherit all that, I think. You know. and, uh, and I think it's, uh, what do you mean in a wrong? sense, presented us with these impossible problems inside our own discipline. You know. I think it would be wrong, wrong for, for us to pretend that we, 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 don't, we don't understand what you're saying or don't agree with it. I mean, obviously, this, this, this thing you're discussing, this aspect, is uh, something which engages us very much, you know. It's, it's a question of the, the um, emphasis, I think, you know. I mean, I would, I would accept very much your, your point, that given that site, that context, that site, 
um, it's regrettable that there isn't a more um, potential interface between public and private. But it, that, I think, is a problem of the context, actually, more than the, the, um, the building. I mean, perhaps there are other versions which might have um, written, uh, uh, met your, your criticism. But the basic problem is a context, a contextual one. I think, I think also there may, be, there may be something in the fact that, that we, have, we have moved in a fairly sort of in a fairly linear direction from using traditional construction to rather deli deliberately experimenting with, with uh, dry construction. And probably the earlier buildings we had were, were, were <coughs> more, clearly, uh, more clearly exhibited this, this, um, this uh, preoccupation with the, the contrast between the public and the private realm and hierarchies and so on. Um, may appear to express that more clearly than the later buildings. I think that's, may I, John may not agree with me, but it, I do think there's a, there is a problem attached to the use of, um, of dry construction methods uh, in which you lose, there's a certain plasticity which is lost um, and there's a certain tendency to, to use universalized solutions. And I, this, I think, is a deliberate, challenge we've taken up to try and find if there's a way of combining these two <coughs> these two things which you know one could so easily do in, in brickwork you know in, in a school built of brick and that, and that kind of construction but it, it seemed to us progressively that one has to come to terms with with um, these sort of materials and products which um, in spite of the um, in spite of prophecies of doom are probably going to gradually supersede, you know, materials that are made by hand. And uh, I personally wouldn't say it would necessarily succeed in, in bridging this gap. But I, no. but I think it is, probably that's one of the reasons why, why this, these questions do crop up. But the, in, is industrialization of building not becoming more and more, the building itself more and more as a myth? And that in fact, that the buildings which are those industrial buildings you have done mm -hmm. are really handmade. They're well, handmade, I mean, it's well, a matter of degree. <coughs> Everything is handmade, it's not like that, actually. Yes, but it's the size, the, of, it's the, the, yes. the important thing is the size of the no, plant. It's the good. size of the plant. And, and, and therefore, the proposition and, and where they're made. Made. interesting, the, the uh, proposition of universality. Mm -hmm. if, is this now meant as a type to be constructed all over the country? No, not necessarily. And the same roof, same panels? No, not yeah. necessarily, but there is a problem there, because, it, because if you, because you get a different size of the basic element, if you're using a brick or a, or a piece of stone as a basic element, you've obviously got virtually infinite flexibility. But if you're using larger elements, which on the whole are, are the result of some kind of industrial process, then um, obviously there is a sort of built-in tendency towards uniformity, I suppose. But I'm not sure that the answer to that is to sort of go back to the past. The answer is to try and find some solution out of the, out of the present. For instance, in that, John didn't actually mention it, but there were among the many reasons why the, the roof structure had its particular characteristics in Lowers Avenue was to try and find a solution to, to a problem that hasn't been solved, which is how do you combine partitioning space with an open structure roof? Now this, I mean, up till now, you either have to fill the roof in, which is what Mies does, yes. or you have a, have a space <coughs> where you have no partitions whatsoever. And this produces the kind of ultimate universal building which actually can't be used for anything except the exhibition. So we were trying to find a solution which simultaneously made it possible, possible for us to do without full ceilings, which actually are quite expensive, and also to partition the building up into you know, usable subspaces. And this is one of the reasons why, came, why we came to, to this, uh, one of the reasons for this result. I'm not saying it was altogether successful, because the spaces probably are not uh, soundproofed enough from each other to really to, to <laughs> operate in all conditions. You know. On the level of universality, though, <coughs> you could probably argue perfectly well, couldn't you, that the system that you used for that uh, building, you could use all over the country. 
You could have adapted to another situation. The question is whether the forms would be the same. Uh, the forms might be different, but you could actually probably find a way. You, you might even be tempted to. You might not. I don't know. But it, uh, there are elements in it which are perhaps legitimately universal. I mean, universal within limits, of course. But, uh, boy. You know, we are tired, aren't we, of solving the same problem again and again and again and again in, in, in enormous numbers of different ways. I think our problem is rather more in that direction than in the search for universal types of solution. The discussion brings up an interesting point about the non-neutrality of technique, I think, in terms of expression. Which is what you mentioned which, which is something, you were talking about earlier. Yeah? Mm, which is something one sort of somehow has been suppressed or, or, or has been argued that it is neutral. But I think what, what comes out of this discussion is it's not neutral, it's a expression. No, no. Of course, in the 20s and 30s, it was known that it wasn't neutral and it was actually yes. promulgated. Yes. Because yes. it wasn't neutral. Yes. Right. But it was proposing a universal solution for mankind. I mean, it's just the pendulum has swung now in the other direction. And one's beginning to value its particularity. Well, with that, maybe we ought to bring the discussion to an end and thank John Miller and Alan Cahoon for showing us their uh, very elegant work tonight. Thank you.